Hello all, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale radio control Armor Tech Panther Alpha G. Since the last video update, more, a lot of progress has been made to the model's extra functions as well as some exterior details. To start with, the model's lights have been co connected and are now functional. As mentioned in the first video, the, both the headlight and the taillight are aftermarket parts. They are the, both casted out of bronze or brass and are very detailed. They're also pre-hooked up to a 12-volt light bulb, which makes the wiring a lot simpler. The light is also nicely detailed. However, as we can see, is just a clear tube. I will be covering the tube up with the blue lens as well as possibly even the blackout lens as the build continues. The lights are very bright and can only be turned on if the model is activated. To turn on the model, we again first turn on the radio. We then turn on the tank's main power. The lights are controlled by a power switch that is concealed in the model's detailing, which I'll go over in a minute. But here we go, the light's now on. As you can see, it's very bright. If I remove the blackout cover, we have the, the lens. The lens, as I mentioned in the first video, is nicely detailed and you can see it's actually very bright and very functional. Here we have the tail light and the tail light's now on. As you can see, the light is actually very bright and has a bluish tint to it, which is appropriate for the rear tail light on these German tanks. The main power switch itself is a simply is a very simple manual controlled switch and is not done with the radio. You, the operator can either have the lights on or off. You would typically want to turn them on if you want to do some night driving or if you just want something a little bit different when you're driving the model around. Like I mentioned previously, the tail light and the headlight are both aftermarket and they come pre hooked up and pre-assembled. The wiring, the, the vendor gives you a small length of wire that is encased in shrink tubing, which is a nice feature. And for the rear tail light, you only have to drill a small hole into the rear portion of the hull where the cable would emerge out of. For the headlight on the Panther, it's a little bit more complicated. Unlike a King Tiger, or even the Tiger One where the conduit runs across the deck, on the Panther, it emerges from the bottom of the fender. It actually runs horizontal to the edge here of the fender, and then via conduit runs along the sponson where it enters into the hull through this little armored cover cap over here. This design protects the wiring from the track as well as any debris that would be caught up with the track that would easily just knock any deep or any little appendages that would be emerging from the hull. If we recall from the first video, the previous builder who built the model had the wiring emerge out of this portion here and ran straight along the upper spots in here and emerged from the side here of the hull. As I mentioned in that video, that design is not only detail-wise inc incorrect, but also was in a very poor location cause it would have been easily snagged by the track. As for the actual headlight circuit itself, the previous builder did try to hook up the lighting and he did extend the wires. However, he never connected anything together to a circuit. And it's a good thing that he didn't because the way the individual hooked the, the wiring up was severely incorrect. No photographs were taken, but here's a quick sketch of what the uh, the way this, the extension cord was made. The builder did hook up the, the bulb the short wire to an extension cord so that the wire could be run into the model where you could hook it up to the circuit. Unfortunately, the way the builder did this, the extension cord would have been very bad for the bulb. This quick little drawing here, we have the headlamp. These two leads are the wires that come out of the bulb and 
these two leads here, these two wires, they illustrate the extension cord. He had the two leads soldered together, which is good, and he had the whole cord covered up with a long piece of shrink tubing, which is also a nice touch. Unfortunately, the way the individual soldered the leads together was that he soldered the leads together over here at the same length, and then he left them exposed. The two leads were then shrink wrapped to or shrink tube together, which means that they were touching the entire time. You don't exactly have to be Nikolai Tesla to realize that if these two leads touch each other, you're going to have a short circuit, which can potentially short out the light bulb. The wiring was redone, utilizing his same long wire, only the leads were soldered and then were individually shrink tube together so that no contact was made or can be made between the leads themselves. Also, over here, the way the, the, the wire and the cable was kind of channeled away from the track is via a small little clamp that was made here. The small little sheet metal clamp, if I could get it in focus, is all scratch built and is fitted to one of these mounting bolts for the, for the headlamp. The small little clamp bolts on through the existing threads and permanently keeps the wire nice and snug, nice and tight to the roof, and away from any, the track and any debris that the track might pull with it. While I'm on the front of the vehicle, this gives me an opportunity to go ahead and correct one of the mistakes that was made by the previous builder. On the front portion here of the ArmorTech kit, we can see here that where the tank's tow loop hook would be, there is a small little bushing. The bushing looks like this over here. It's nothing more than a steel insert that simply gets inserted into the hole here. Unfortunately, the previous builder who built the model put the piece on in reverse. This little rigidity or strengthening blister here should actually be on this side of the model. The builder also fastened the bushing on with a very hard epoxy. This epoxy makes plunking the piece out with a hammer very difficult. To, do, to actually remove this piece, I'm actually going to have to hit it with a torch. The procedure was already done to this side of the model. As you can see, I have the bushing removed. The torch will weaken the epoxy, thus allowing me time to remove it from the bond it had with the hull. This is a very risky technique and should only be done if, you have, uh, if you're very careful and you have experience in doing this. For the procedure, I'm going to be using a propane torch, a hammer, and a few assorted punches, as well as even a, a very fine point flathead screwdriver. We will now start the procedure. First, I need to start the torch. Go at a nice low speed, or a nice slow flame and quickly just heat the area around the boss. You don't want to spend too much time on one side. Luckily, since the entire model is made out of metal, you don't have to worry about any of the components melting on you, as you would on, say, a plastic model. However, you don't want to expose the model to heat for too long. After a nice little time with the torch, I quickly turn off the torch and start with the punching. After a few taps, the piece is totally loose now and should pop off within a few more taps. And there we have it. With the piece removed, you can see it's a nice smooth removal without any dings or nicks happening to the steel piece. However, there's still probably some epoxy crud left over on the inside here of the hole. To clean it out, I'm just going to go over it a few times with this round file, just so the hole is nice and clear and allows the bushing to be re replaced in the proper direction nice and smoothly. After the bosses had their holes cleaned up, they were then reinserted onto the body panel in the proper way. And if we look, when the little axis 
hatch here for the tow hook is lifted down, it does not make contact with the boss. In addition to the lighting, another modification or feature that was built into the model was that of the smoke system. The smoke system again is hooked up to the main circuit and to activate it we must again first turn on the model. And unlike the lighting, the smoke system is controlled via the radio via this toggle switch here. I hit the switch and the smoke generator emits the smoke. For the smoke system itself, I use the unit from Harbor Models. That smoke system is a typical system I use on all of my 1.6 scale models and doesn't uh, output the best amount of smoke I've ever seen in a smoke system on the market. The Harbor Model system uses, like many other smoke systems, smoke fluid. This fluid here is what creates the smoke that gets admitted from the exhaust stacks. Uh, the system does need to be refueled from time to time, depending, obviously, how much you utilize the system. To refuel the system, a lot of most model makers, they tend to have a little uh, spout somewhere on the model where they pour the fluid in like that on, say, like a, a, a model train. However, <clears throat> I don't like to get the fluid anywhere near the model's finish because the fluid can stain and partially hurt the finish. So to do that, I developed a refueling system. And on the Panther, I utilized the bins in the back for this purpose. This bin here is not only the storage bin for the model, but it conceals the refueling system. To refuel the model, there is a pump on the inside of the vehicle. And this tube connects to the smoke fluid. There is a small switch that, when powered on, will siphon the fluid through the tube and into the smoke fluid reservoir. And here's the system in action. The fuel pump is, again, hooked up to the main power, so the tank must be on to turn on the pump. I hit a switch. The fuel pump is currently on. I take the fluid, stick it in the tube, and do a nice little squirt. The system is now refueled. Once the tube is drained of all fluid, I simply hit the switch. The, the pump turns off. I then coil up the tube. Re uh, conceal it inside the, the storage container and close the lid. The model is now fully refueled, and I could then activate the smoke system. On the adjacent side of the model, on its secondary storage bin, I also utilize it to conceal the model's function switches. I open up the container, and on the inside here, we have two toggle switches. The red switch here is for the lighting, and the green switch here is going to be for another function that will be shown in the next video. The toggle switch is just a simple switch. Just hit it, and the lights are now on. You don't want the model with the lights on, just simply turn them off via the switch and close the hatch. And here go the bins prior to the installation of the Zemmer coating. The, on the Panther, the bins featured a mounting system which utilized a strip of metal that ran along the leading edge of the bin. And towards the bottom of the bin, there are brackets for a plate to be bolted that connects the bin to the unresponsive of the hull. After these details were added, they were fabricated, they were all soldered to the bin making for a nice strong seal, as well as a realistic one with the welds being present. After these details were added, the bin has its coat of Zemmer coating added. Here goes the underbelly of the model, and we can see here the mounting plate that connects the storage box to the other portion of the sponson. As we can see, the plate is gapped, as it is on the real vehicle. 
pretty much what this plate did was a securing plate and it kept the bin from rattling around. The way the bin mounted on the Panther was that it had small brackets welded to the hull and two clips welded to the back portion of the bin here. The bin literally slid onto the braces and to keep the bin from falling off, this bottom plate here would be a retaining plate and kept everything in place. All Panthers from the A to the G use this locking plate design. In addition to the Zemmerich being added to the aftermarket bins, the Zemmer coating was also added to the aftermarket machine gun ball that was mounted to the front. In a previous video, I described that some work was, or some modifications were made to this section here of the model's front transmission housing. Namely, the replacement of the kit hex bolt with that of a concealed countersunk bolt. As we can see, the, uh, the bodywork has all been completed and the countersunk bolt here is totally immersed in the model nice and seamlessly. This was done to both sides of the transmission and once painted will no longer be seen. And here's the model with the cover off to see the new additional electronics. Starting with the smoke generator and refueling system. This is the Harbor model smoke generator with its powerful 12 volt fan. The generator itself was branched out to two outings because of the two exhaust stacks. As of note, the exhaust stacks need to be removed when I was fitting in the unit because a small bead of silicone needs to be added around the exhaust cover. Without the silicone, the, f the smoke will seep out through the seam and will look like you actually have a, a worn out gasket on your exhaust covers. In addition to the silicone added to the covers, silicone was also added all around the joints that connect the smoke system together. Because of the high pressure fan, the smoke will try to find any easily escapable seam to, to seep out of and will not look good when you have smoke emerging from your engine bay. So the silicone prevents that. As for the refueling system, a, there was a simple modification. I just drilled a hole into the side here. The two, a small lum, bent aluminum tube is then fixed via plumbing into this Habaco 12 volt top fueler. The fueler is pumped, or the setting is pumped so that fluid flows into the system and into the, the smoke system. Again, this is the entry tube which go, exits out of the rear armor plate here and into the storage bin where it is coiled. As for the power, the cord runs all the way up to the front here where it enters a a power box which is connected to the main power box for the tank over here. The power outlet spreads the outlet or spreads the voltage to all of the functions that are added extra. Over here besides the recharge jacks are the two power switches that are for the the smoke and the refueling system. This switch here is a main cutoff switch for the the smoke generator. If you want to drive the model without the smoke generator and you don't want to waste any battery power or if you hit the switch, you, if you hit the control switch on the radio, you don't want it to, to power up like if you hit the switch accidentally, this power switch here kills all power to the smoke generator. A simple flick and the smoke generator is powered off permanently. And now it is powered on. This switch here with the, with the white cap, this switch here turns on your fuel pump. All of these switches here are accessible through the radio operator hatch on the top deck. Moving along, we have here the function switch for the smoke. It's a simple servo with an impact switch. You hit the switch on the radio, activates the servo, makes contact with the impact switch here, and that gives power to the smoke generator, which turns it on. As for the lighting, it is a very simple series circuit. There's the headlight wire from the inside where it emerges from the sponson. It runs along the 
the top portion of the sponson connects here to the tail light, which there it gets broken up to the power switch here, which is inside the uh, storage box. The wire then moves to along the side portion here of the hull to the power differential box. These two wires here we have loose. These wires here are is for that other switch, which will be for that other function that is coming in the next video. And here's the action from underneath the hood. I turn on the radio, turn on the tank. It's always important to do it in that format. The model is on. Hit the switch. Smoke is emitting now from the exhaust. Like I said before, you want to kill the power. That switch there on the dash kills the power to the smoke generator no matter how much I hit the toggle switch. This is again if you want to drive the tank without any worrying of accidentally hitting the switch and having it burn up all of your smoke fluid. I turn the switch on again. The power is connected. The only way to keep it from activating is from the switch here on the radio. As for the refuel, the simple. Now you're now you would be refueling the smoke generator. And when you're done, you just hit the little white rubber switch here, and it turns off the fueler. Again, fueling, not fueling, smoking, smoke kill switch. You see there's the servo making impact with the impact switch and no matter how many times it hits it, it will not activate because the main power switch is off. I turned it off here, let me turn it on here, the circuit's live, and now it activates. Realistically, you just want to leave this in the on state at all time, in case, unless you want to drive the model indoors or you don't want to accidentally waste all your smoke fluid. And here's the smoke generator from a different angle. And the radio control control for the smoke system. Because all of the functions are powered by 12 volt, the model only has two batteries, being the two 12 volt batteries that are hooked up in series. Everything else gets divided by the power box, which supplies power to the entire model. This simplifies the model a lot in that there is absolutely no other batteries to worry about for recharging or replacement. You run the model, you need to charge it up because the batteries are running low. You just plug your jacks into this power jack system here, hit the charge switch like what was illustrated in the previous video, and you're good to go. As a sneak peek for the next video update, currently the completion of the lighting and the smoke finishes all of the functions that were required for the lower hull. With those complete, I am now focusing on the top deck. As you notice, the fan covers are missing. That's because I temporarily removed them because they are currently undergoing redetailing. Stay tuned for a lot more progress to happen on the top deck of the model. And with that, that concludes this video update for this 1 6 scale Radio Control Armor Tech Panther Alpha G. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook. Also, don't forget to check out EastCoastArmory.com for more 1-6 scale tank builds as well as other 1-6 scale detail components. Thank you.